The convenient truth about the Jewish people is that when we put our minds and our capital to work, we can make amazing things happen. We can make miracles happen. There is no more noble cause than saving humanity itself, <laughs> ensuring that God's covenant not to, to wipe out the planet with rising waters will be in some small measure because of our actions and our collective actions. So the march, you know, felt it so keenly, both as a march, but also as a religions group, and then as the part of the proud Jewish uh, contingent. We really, really felt that. Uh, felt it. It is for this purpose that I believe that we have been created, that we have survived, and that we're allowed to say that we have flourished as a people. There is no higher fulfillment of Jewish mission than to save the majesty of God's creation. And to do so as individuals, as part of a global Jewish collective with a national platform called the State of Israel. Saving the earth itself from climate change and the billions of people and animals on it is not just environmentalism. It is not just sustainability. It is ethical, global survival. And of all the trillions and trillions and trillions of cosmic opportunities for life to potentially flourish, is on this third rock from the sun, we may be the only expression, the only experiment to grace the universe with the possibility of collective moral choice. It's an awesome responsibility. As Jews, we need to transform ourselves from the misunderstood light unto the nations, as Isaiah beckoned, to be a renewable light unto the nations. Okay. Now, the, one of the best things I ever learned was in Young Judea, a uh, national convention, 1980, I don't know, one, if anybody was there, uh, G4 bunk, uh, in Alice. <laughs> and um, it's a peer-led movement, and it was about values. And it kind of struck me through the discussion sitting alone on the floor, and I had none of my titles. Um, let me tell you what I've learned that has been so instrumental to me that I hope will be helpful to you. It's a very simple formula that's followed me and inspired me uh, throughout my crazy journey. It goes like this. Values are what you live by. Vision is what you live towards. And leadership is the very simple yet courageous act of living your values towards your vision. Because almost nobody does it. And yet we can all do it. We can all do it. And what is true for us as individuals is also true for institutions. Since our institutions, and we're one of the, the, the great historic ones today, they're supposed to be the collective manifestation of our values. We're supposed to have a collective vision for our community. And so therefore, it's not just good enough for, uh, for us to identify our values, live it, and exercise leadership. Like the gentleman in our solar group who put up solar panels uh, five years ago and just bought an electric car. Raise your hand, uh, right? Uh, is your, uh, what, what's your name? Steve Cavill. Steve Cavill, he was a leader. He's, he just, he had a particular idea. He did something modest, get revolutionary. He's living it. And so, man, you're, you're on uh, zero emissions. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's very inspiring. But, with, with, but that formula as an individual now needs to, to come into the Jewish community. And so what's true for the individual is true for our institutions, because we're supposed to represent our collective values. And what's true for ourselves and the institutions has to be true for the state of Israel as our, as our public face and as our, our, really our platform, our collective platform um, that uh, certainly the federation world and certainly this federation has been so intertwined with uh, its history, but our collective platform to solve global problems. Um, as you heard from Nigel, I have a pretty checkered past. Uh, um, you know, I, I have some uh, arrests, you know, Soviet jury, anti-apartheid, all, all of those different things. And, you know, managed to kind of be a footnote somewhere in, 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 the great, um, in the great issues of my, you know, formative uh, early years. And I, and I really echo so much of what uh, Karina Gore spoke about on so many levels. And I think we need to get that speech and put in the, both the video and the text and get it out there. Um, but as she so articulately said, that 
that climate change is the social justice issue for our entire generation. And so it completely, completely like speaks to me and, and lifts me up and it gives me a sense of Jewish purpose uh, in the world. Um, I, I, as you heard, I did all those crazy things uh, as a young person. And then, I'll just tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, we did show up at Kibbutz Keturah in the Arabah, in Kibbutz, for a two-year kind of sabbatical to hang out with our five kids and uh, write some books. Um, and uh, it was really funny. <laughs> and uh, when I found out that there was no solar power in Israel, we all know about the hot water, but it was just kind of, and when you show up in the Arabah Desert on August 24th, Oh man, <laughs> nothing could be more obvious. So I don't, it's not, no, there's no active vision in being able to show up in the third most extreme desert in the world in, in the summer and say, oh yeah, maybe, maybe someone should do solar power. The difference is really that I, I had the background of, of an anti-apartheid activist and of a Soviet Jewry activist, both quixotic, moral, global campaigns that um, were just the, just the, the greatest human rights victories in the, in the history of the world. Um, and, uh, and, and to know to go from our set of values and, uh, and our story and universalize it, uh, and to succeed and to come out. So when I, when I was told you're, you're a naive American kibbutznik, you and your, your partners will never succeed in the state of Israel, that, 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 that sounded like a cynical Israeli um, kind of perspective, and I was like, well, wait a second, I, like, we used to get Hebrew teachers out of solitary confinement in Siberia, we can't change a couple of laws in our <laughs> <laughs> Having that collective Jewish peoplehood activism mode that, that set me out on a journey that certainly we could not have predicted um, when I was doing the first uh, Jewish websites and stuff. And, uh, we got Baba Gavu's magazine or Shmuel. Um, I was very fortunate to partner with uh, David Rosenblatt from the New York area, Young Jdan as well, and I have Ed Hoffman from Kibbutz Keturah. And we formed a company, the Arab Power Company. Um, kind, of a, it's kind of a ludicrous thing to, to do, uh, but I had a lot of time on my hands. And it was sunny and there was a lot of money, and uh, it made environmental sense. It didn't make any financial sense yet. And, we set out on a long and difficult journey that I won't bore you with. We had to win a hundred political, regulatory, and statutory battles to de-risk the market so that we can invest lots of money. And it, it took five years. I'm not, I'm not proud of that as a, a citizen of the state of Israel. Um, but I am proud that we, uh, we did it. We created the, the, the first solar field in the state of Israel. Um, now there, there are many. Anybody who's coming on the Chazon Arava bike ride, you'll, you'll go by a bunch of them. and. Um, and right now, actually, uh, our other power is in the middle of building a 40 megawatt solar field. It will be our ninth, wow. I believe. And it, this is going to power a third of a lot during the day and kill the need for the um, diesel uh, heavy fuel generators during the day. And that's, that's like such an environmental victory. And again, it's not something that I would have predicted as someone who is, I would call myself a regular Jewish environmentalist beforehand. I think we had the first hybrid in Massachusetts. And, Kind of those those little acts, and what I what I loved about today is the combination of kind of the big vision pieces, and then, and then all the all the different ideas that were just you know coming out in discussions. And I'm a big believer, big believer in, in tying those little acts to, to a greater story. And, um, and and I feel like I've been privileged to live one of those one of those great stories with, with my partners. And so. In Israel, we have a lot of work to do. We're only almost two percent renewables. That's a that's a travesty. One thing I want to say also, uh, related to that, and people don't know this, but really the founding fathers of the state of Israel um, had a uh, uncanny sense of vision when it comes to energy. And, and Ben Gurion, people kind of know about Ben Gurion in the desert, but he in the 50s figured out the hot water thing, and that's why Israel's number one on that. He also knew that the future was going to be electricity, and uh, it was a quote from 55 or 56. Um, from Ben Gurion about that, so it's, it's amazing, you know, a generation or two later to kind of stand in those footsteps and be able to finally manifest um, at least a hint of that vision. What people don't know is that Herzl in his diaries actually empower, you know, envisioned that the um, future state of the Jews, as he called it, would be completely on, on, on renewables. And, um, 
because he had traveled to the Dead Sea, and hydropower then was, uh, people knew about hydropower. He, he wanted the entire country to be powered on, on green energy at the time. And we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. So I always thought we we're going to get Israel to go green. And then from there, we'll then go out and, and help other countries. But Israel's taking a little bit too long. And um, people like me and Nancy, um, so we're fighting the good fight uh, with my partners. But while we're building that first field at Kibbutz Keturah, we got besieged, really. It was a tsunami, a good tsunami. People from 58 different countries came to see us in that year and said, hey, start a nation. <coughs> so we were now prepared for that. And we set up a, a second company um, that for two years did some learning, looked over all over the world, looked at half the planet that didn't have solar energy. And they said, is there a value added here? Is there something? And I just want to relate um, something that uh, Karina said before. I don't know if you heard, it was one line, but the comfort that it gives her and the other faith groups that the Jewish people, with, with our moral legacy, are, are with them in this. Like, the way we perceive in the world, and I go all over the world, and what people expect us to do in terms of help solve some of those gigantic global problems that seem like they're not solvable is huge. And we better, we better not disappoint anybody, <laughs> including ourselves, um, down there. And so, we felt the responsibility to do it right. Through some trial and error, we eventually got to East Africa. And the, the problem with our model, <coughs> excuse me, is that we realized as we looked, surveyed the whole world that 75% of our potential work will be in Africa. But other than in South Africa, no one's ever been able to do the business part of this, the bankable <coughs> long-term agreement with the government, the international big finance that's needed, the insurance package to wrap it up, the importing of all that technology, the actually building it and connecting it successfully through grad because it's Africa, right? And, um, and so I would say that my partners and I took an extraordinary amount of risk, and here I want to really single out to Chaim Motsen, uh, my partner who led that effort, and I think we did it because we're Zionists and we're Jews. In addition to, okay, it's impact investing, we'll, we'll make some money, that's, that's also fine. More importantly, we'll deploy a lot more capital. And so I think our, our sense of mission meant we were ready to tolerate uh, more risk. Uh, our success in Israel meant we had some extra knowledge. Um, and also the faith that the Rwandan government put in us was uh, extraordinary. They actually locked me up personally in the deal. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do certain things. Uh, they, they actually wanted, you know, the Jewish, Israeli, crazy, green Zionist person um, to 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 be there. We weren't like flipping the contract. They wanted us to be there. And again, that sense of trust, of trust is a is an, is an awesome you know, responsibility. Um, and so now we're looking to replicate the scale because once you've done the first one, you can do many more. And uh, President Obama has an initiative called Power Africa, the Electrification of Africa. And of all the gazillions of dollars that's been pledged and all the many companies that are saying they're going to do something, um, we were pleased that the uh, administration sent a high-ranking um, official in the U.S. Ambassador to Rwanda was there Thursday. We're just talking right now. I went Thursday to cutting the ribbon to Jerusalem for Shabbat with the family to Florida to here. So, and, and I do my offsets, by the way. I do my offsets. <laughs> um, but um, they were able to announce that uh, this little Israeli company is actually the, um, in this field in Rwanda, being the collective manifestation of our values, right, in, in a sense. Um, it's the first uh, grid connected. Uh, Power Africa initiative on the entire continent. And that goes back to a tribute to all of us. So, you know, we're open for questions and Nigel will come up for it, but what I really want to say is that first figure out how we're going to live our lives and uh, we're not doing good enough. I'm not doing good enough. Uh, and that we're, we're, just because we're morally compromised doesn't mean, or we're, not, we're morally impure on this, doesn't mean we cannot we cannot, you know, progress. We cannot make the one or two changes first in our lives today. Figure out what it is 
uh, and then share that with our families and our social circles and our communities and our schools that are, that are all represented here. And, and that's why the, the Green Fellowship really gives me a lot of hope because it's a multiplier uh, effect. And we're New what New York does, others will do. Um, with that, I want to talk about one last piece. And uh, I'm sorry the, uh, that uh, Eric stepped out. But this Shabbat is Global Divestment Day from Fossil Fuels Day. It's the first time it's happening. It's on the 13th and 14th, Friday and, and Saturday. And where the Israel and the Jewish community is conspicuously absent, conspicuously silent. Now, the Christian pension funds and other funds, they're used to investing their values according to their values. They're billions of dollars where they won't, um, you know, they'll make sure they're invested in companies that aren't in firearms or um, <coughs> Catholic uh, abortions um, or tobacco. Certainly has been kind of banned from most of the portfolios of, uh, of Christian denominations. Now the World Council of Churches, which represents half a billion Christians, they're pulling their funds out of fossil fuels. We heard earlier about union uh, as well. That's, that's great. There's a campaign by the Catholics now to have the Vatican divest from oil. So imagine this, this Shemitah year, this year of environmental holy sabbatical, that every board of every Jewish communal fund should meet to divest from tar sands, to divest from coal, to divest from oil. And use those funds in ways that resonate with both our personal values and our communal values and our aspirational values for the Jewish people and for the state of Israel. Wouldn't it be great if 18% of the portfolio were invested in, um, in Israel? Because right now the investments in Israel are, are, are minimal. But what if it was social environmental ventures in Israel that were for profit but actually you know, gave, gave jobs to, to, to people who need the jobs, uh, the, the underemployed in Israel? Um, or to, you know, could be water treatment facilities for both Palestinians and Israelis. There's plenty of places where this kind of money can go, this for-profit money. And then imagine if a portion of, of those available funds would, would be put into, could be renewable energy projects around the world in the name of the Jewish people, uh, and, and, and similarly. And so the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and remember Rockefeller, Standard Oil, they're divesting from tar sands, coal, and, and oil. And if they have figured out how to do it, and 50 other leading foundations, American foundations, have figured out how to do it, then we have no excuse as a people. It's not just that we have no excuse. This building holds probably $900 million in, uh, in, in uh, endowment funds. And so as we're greening our lives, and our institutions, we have to green, green our money in ways that are aligned with our, our values and, and aspirations. And so with that, it's just a great honor to, uh, to be here with you and to, to see the growth of the vision that started on a bicycle kind of sweep the, the whole country. And it's great to be your partner in all of that. Thank you so much.